The hot topic here in terms of treatment uh, has been how do we manage a patient who has central sleep apnea that perhaps is related to heart failure. We, uh, we now have had two fairly well done large trials that have indicated that uh, sophisticated positive pressure approaches, uh, bi-level pressure and ASV for central sleep apnea and heart failure are, are probably not uh, the way to go, at least not for certain kinds of patients. So I think um, one of the things that we're going to have to grapple with is when do you treat central sleep apnea? Maybe we, it's better off to leave it alone, but if you do treat it, how is the best way to treat that? And I, and I personally don't know the answer to that question, and that is a space that I will watch closely. I think that for us, and this is important for what CHESS does, sort of feeling, uh, filling the workforce gap and practitioners who can manage garden variety obstructive sleep apnea, which probably affects one in 10 of us, is a huge challenge. Uh, and I hope that CHESS could be part of the solution to that challenge. So this is obstructive sleep apnea. Ten seconds. Okay, that's obstructive sleep apnea. This is central sleep apnea. Ten seconds. So the difference is there is the patient who is obstructed is trying to breathe but the airway is closed and the air can get down. The person with central has some disconnect between the signal to breathe and the pump that makes it happen. And obstructive sleep apnea has very different causes and treatments. And central sleep apnea, I'm not sure what the treatment is. Uh, central sleep apnea tends to be seen in patients with heart failure that's fairly advanced. It tends to be seen in patients who are taking drugs that suppress the drive to breathe like opioids or benzodiazepines and the numbers of those people are actually increasing. And we also see it uh, in people with an acute stroke. So. Uh, the, probably the number of people in that category is uh, smaller than obstructive sleep apnea. The risk factors for obstructive sleep apnea are age, actually, particularly in women. The prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea goes up with age. Obesity, uh, but one of the important messages I think to get across is that you don't have to be obese to have obstructive sleep apnea. You could just be older. We also see obstructive sleep apnea in certain uh, uh, populations. There's clear evidence now that being Asian is an independent risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea, perhaps to do with the shape of the jaw. And clearly now, we've learned that obstructive sleep apnea runs in families. There are some genetics, some of the work we've done at my place, the University of Kentucky, is, uh, is adding to the body of evidence that indicates that uh, sleep apnea runs in families, perhaps uh, by a gene that codes for a short jaw or small posterior airspace. So, uh, so the, the causes of central obstructive apnea are very different. There's no question for obstructive sleep apnea, the treatment of choice is to, you know, to lose weight if you can, quit smoking if you can, no matter what's wrong with you, and then CPAP, that's a treatment of choice for obstructive sleep apnea. For central sleep apnea, I would hesitate to say what the treatment is right now other than um, heart failure needs to be optimally managed. And frankly, I think the prevalence of sleep, uh, central sleep apnea is probably on the decline because our cardiology colleagues are so good now at managing uh, central sleep apnea. And then, of course, avoid respiratory depressants. Uh, we try to say to them, uh, so uh, the approach to this is not straightforward, but we'll be here with you. We'll go through this with you. Uh, but the first thing to do is to try to figure out why they have it, because the message might be, you have central sleep apnea. It's due to your heart failure. I am going to give you a diuretic to help you. I'm going to send you to the cardiologist to help you. Um, but the message might be, you have central sleep apnea, and we need to cut down on the Lortab. I'm not sure there is a shortage of sleep doctors. There's a shortage of people who can manage sleep apnea. 
And I don't believe that you need to be a sleep doctor to manage sleep apnea. The prevalence of sleep apnea is higher than the prevalence of asthma. And you don't have to be a pulmonologist to manage asthma. I mean, we pulmonologists have agreed to that a long time ago. When you have a condition that is deadly and prevalent, everybody needs to get into the game. So I, uh, I think that there is, a, there is a shortage of people who are willing to take on this, who feel adequately prepared to deal with this. And that's part of our job at CHEST, right? So uh, ask me again in five years. Uh, but I, I think there are, plen there, there are more than enough pulmonologists who know enough about this, about breathing, that's what we do, to take care of this right now. We've just got to get them to do it. What I think we at CHEST are trying to do is to empower the pulmonologists to take over the work that they've, they've been pushed aside, frankly, by the sleep specialists whose numbers are plummeting. And as the number of sleep specialists dwindles for all kinds of reasons, pulmonologists need to step up. We at CHEST recognize that. We at CHEST want to empower and educate pulmonologists to take over the sleep and breathing part. And this comes back to something we talked about early on. Because you're a pulmonologist, you shouldn't be expected to manage a neurological disorder, which is what narcolepsy is, or perhaps a behavioral or, or mood disorder, which much of insomnia is. But you darn well need to know about a breathing disorder, which is what sleep apnea is. And pulmonologists, and I do hope you quote me on this, need to take sleep apnea back.